In the 9990 syllabus, the second unit for psychology of abnormality is entitled bipolar and related disorders. Um, I think it's best to start with the related disorders before moving on to what bipolar disorder actually is. Uh, and better yet, to even go first to depression. Depression and bipolar are separated in the DSM, but you need to know the characteristics of one before you get to the other. So I think depression is a good place to build our understanding. The word depression is used uh, nowadays in casual conversation quite often. So it's important that we distinguish between depression colloquially and professionally. And there's several ways we could do that by just putting a word before we could call uh, depression, unipolar depression, to differentiate it uh, from bipolar, which we'll talk about at a later time in this video, or we can call it major or severe depression. Any uh, disorder or condition that affects your mood uh, and your expression of mood is often called an affective disorder, and these used to be pulled together, bipolar and uh, unipolar, in one place. Uh, but now in the DSM-5, these disorders are now separated uh, in two separate chapters. Okay, going back for a second, uh, we're gonna look in uh, real quick at um, not only the, the diagnostic criteria for depression, but also how we can measure it using something called the BDI. In order to qualify as a person suffering from major depression, you must check off uh, five at least boxes out of nine possible symptoms. Uh, and these symptoms could be uh, affective symptoms, which are things related to emotion and mood. And there are four which are somatic or things related to uh, your physical health. You don't really need to memorize this if you just use some common sense. You know, I think most people are familiar with what it means to be profoundly sad at one point in their lives. Uh, just imagine that stretched out for at least a two week period of time. Or maybe you know somebody who suffered from depression. It's not the most uncommon of disorders. So you could memorize some of these, but I think some of them are quite um, obvious. For example, maybe feelings of guilt, maybe feelings of fatigue, uh, maybe uh, you're not able to think clearly, you're distracted easily, you're indecisive. Um, actually, distracted easily, it's more, <laughs> that's more like ADHD. Ignore what I said about that. But um, these seem to be quite obvious in some cases. The less obvious ones are things perhaps like significant weight loss or weight gain, and there's a 5% threshold to determine whether or not that is significant or insignificant weight gain. It has to be 5% of body weight change in either direction uh, within a month. Uh, insomnia, some people uh, stay awake with their thoughts. Hypersomnia, some people sleep away their mood, hoping to wake up in a different state of mind. Okay, so as I said, uh, these are now separated out in the DSM-4, which is represented by the purple boxes. Interestingly, uh, SAD, or Seasonal Affective Disorder, is no longer a separate category in the DSM. Uh, seasonal Affective Disorder is that affective disorder that happens during usually the winter months when there's less uh, light and people all of a sudden feel quite depressed, um, usually coinciding in the West, at least, with the holiday season. Okay, and there again are the nine symptoms just shortened from the DSM screenshot that I had taken. So this is a much easier list to follow. Um, it's important to note that the major depression is not bereavement, all right? Bereavement being the loss of a loved one, that feeling that accompanies uh, death, all right? So that's actually, you're supposed to feel that way uh, if something in your life important has gone away like a, a loved one. And just an interesting conversation piece would be, women tend to be more diagnosed with depression than men, okay? Now there's no reason to believe that they actually are more depressed than men, but they are more diagnosed with men. And some of the theories uh, have to do with uh, perhaps willingness uh, or social uh, learning about what it means to be a man or what it means to be a woman, uh, emoting versus hiding your feelings. Um, so maybe that's going to change with time as gender differences get reconstructed across time. 
but that's a whole other conversation. Okay, so now that you know some of the symptoms of depression, and you're welcome to know all nine, if you want to pause for one of the screens from earlier, uh, we should talk about how to measure it. And there's really um, several ways to measure a psychological condition that's uh, internal. And we could talk about using psychometric tests, um, which are the more preferred way to do things nowadays than projective tests. Uh, projective tests tend to be uh, much more open to interpretation. Uh, they have less scoring rubrics um, and less validity, usually, and reliability. So let's use a psychometric test here, and we're going to use um, the BDI. Let me skip past here real quick. What does the BDI stand for? It stands for the Beck Depression Inventory. Okay, so you're going to hear the name Beck several times in this unit. Uh, the man's name is Aaron Beck. He's a cognitive psychologist, very influential in the field of cognitive therapy, and you know, still in the top 10 most cited um, psychologists of the 20th slash 21st century. Uh, but let's get to his psychometric tool here. It's 21 questions. Uh, questions can be broken down into uh, effective or somatic questions. So they align pretty well with the DSM criteria for what makes for a depressed person, a severely depressed person. And it's actually quite a simple tool. Uh, it's everything scored from zero to three, so it's a four point scale. And you just sum, uh, sum up those numbers and those numbers tell you something different uh, about what is the possibility of your state of mind. Um, these first questions here, I believe, are all effective, okay? But there are questions later on that are more about your bodily function, your sleep, and things like that. Okay. Uh, when you answer a questionnaire like this, the only thing you could really check for on your own is face validity. Does it seem to be measuring what it's supposed to be measuring? And just know that the reason why we use the BDI is that it is well checked for both validity and reliability. Otherwise, it wouldn't be used so prevalently. So whenever you talk about a psychometric test uh, that's presented in this book or in this unit or in this um, syllabus, you're usually going to say it is quite reliable and valid with rare exception. Uh, if you want to just really quickly talk about uh, the exam, uh, there will be times where you'll be asked to create perhaps your own um, questionnaire. So it's important to know about how to check validity and reliability. All right? I have a separate video that I will create on validity and reliability eventually, so I'm going to largely skip most of these slides. Um, but if you want to know um, what the numbers actually mean. You could find the BDI online and take it yourself. Uh, there are six possible outcomes. Uh, the higher the number, uh, the more extreme your depression is. Okay. And my students quickly just created their own within five minutes. It's, don't look at the one on the right. Okay. Um, theirs didn't have uh, any sort of external uh, validity. Skipping, skipping, skipping. Uh, again, this is stuff that will be covered in a different video regarding reliability and validity. Okay, so let's get to the causes of uh, these disorders, namely depression first. Uh, we like to st uh, start with attribution, which is a theory of depression that was largely populated by a man named Martin Seligman. And I like to start with Seligman's early work on learned helplessness. You may have heard the story of the obedient elephant or the elephant who doesn't try to escape his situation merely because of his past experiences. Uh, so if an elephant was a child, a baby elephant tied to a stake that couldn't escape that rope and stake situation, as it grows older, it will cease trying even though it is powerful enough to escape his seemingly inescapable situation. And Seligman did studies, I believe in the 70s, with dogs who were in a box that had two sides uh, separated by a hurdle, and both sides of the box were 
had these shock rates on the floor that would electrify the dog, and no matter where he went, the dog would experience pain. Uh, if you put the dog in the same situation uh, weeks later, it would remember the previous experience and would no longer even try to escape, even though only one half of the floor was shocked. So this could be used uh, and applied to people if they found a situation where they constantly fail and realize there's nothing they could do to escape that failure, then they may just give up. So learned helplessness is a uh, long phrase for simply giving up. You think the situation is futile. And many people who suffer from depression see a futility to their situation. Um, you may have found this with certain school subjects. You keep failing a math exam and then you don't even try to study anymore. Uh, what's the point? And this is sort of like having like a fixed mindset about your life or your, your, your situation. Uh, moving on to uh, attribution theory, we use uh, another psychometric called the ASQ. And the ASQ stands for the Attributional Style Questionnaire. And this is a commonly used instrument to measure uh, one's perceptions about their situation. Are their situations uh, going to be temporary or forever? Are they about everything or just a single situation? And are they applicable to one situation or to every situation? So, I don't know if I just repeated myself there. I'm sorry if I did. Uh, you have to buy the instrument, so you really can't get a ready, uh, readily made copy on the internet. Um, but you could get some sample questions. The questionnaire is broken up into four categories. There are three questions or three items about good achievement, three about bad achievement, three about good affiliation or social life, and bad social situations or social life. So uh, the person fills out this questionnaire and you have uh, quantitative values to see how that person makes attributions. Let's use a simple example to start us off. Um, so perhaps you failed an exam. When students fail exams, they might make excuses blaming something that's external to themselves, or they may blame themselves. So keep in mind, by the way, the word attribution can be replaced with the word blame. Who do you blame? Uh, so if I say I failed the exam because I didn't study hard enough, that would be an internal attribution. Or if I say I'm stupid, that's also internal, but they're two very different things. I didn't study enough is something that is just temporary. So it's something that's unstable. Whereas I'm stupid is forever. That's something that's stable. If I say it's something external, like the teacher quizzed us on things that he never taught us, that would be external. Um, and if I say something like, let me think of something else, I'm just unlucky, uh, you know, luck would also be something that's external. So here are some possibilities. So let's see one that's in the bad achievement, just like the one we just saw. Um, failing an exam is bad achievement. Uh, not getting a job after a job interview is also a bad achievement. Now the first item, or the first question for item one, uh, you didn't get a job, uh, you were unsuccessful for some time, write down one major cause. This is qualitative, obviously, but most of the data could be uh, quantitatively gathered. So the first one, is the cause of your unsuccessful job search due to something about you or something about the other people or circumstance? If you choose the numbers to the left, you're having an external attribution. If you're doing the numbers to the right, you're having an internal attribution. For number three, uh, will this be a, a problem again in the future? Um, if you say it won't be, then it's a temporary thing or an unstable situation. Whereas if it's always going to be a problem, it's permanent or stable. So again, number two is about internal, external. Three is about stable, unstable. And the fourth one is about global or specific. Is it about one situation or is it about all situations in your life? So for example, could you apply this to looking for a relationship with a person? Could you apply this to um, you know, any other attribute of a uh, situation of your life.
Okay, let me give you uh, one more example. You meet a friend who compliments you on your appearance. So this one here would be good affiliation. So again, number two uh, would be internal, external. Number three will be stable, unstable. And number four would be um, uh, specific or global. Okay. Uh, through secondary resources, uh, we could actually find out what all the items are. These are the 12 items uh, organized by uh, their various categories here. So you can gather separate scores for each of these. Um, and some people would say that the, uh, the reason for depression, as I skip for all these, is that the bad stuff you make internal, you make the bad stuff global, it's everything, and you make the bad stuff stable, which is forever. So according to attribution theory, um, it's the bad stuff that stays forever. It's the bad stuff that's because it's your fault. It's the bad stuff um, that will be in every situation. So just to simplify and to restate, depression is caused by internal, global, stable, attributions. Okay, another cause of depression is due to what is known as cognitive errors or uh, cognitive distortions or faulty thinking. And so, of course, this is going to align with uh, cognitive psychology. So let's identify some of the cognitive errors. Okay, this is an image I borrowed from the internet. Um, when you are depressed, you filter out the good and just hone in on the bad. And this kind of filtering is quite common, and this has also been coined by Aaron Beck, the guy who created the BDI that we talked about just a few moments ago. So please know this name when talking about the cognitive elements of depression. Uh, like many cognitive psychologists like Piaget and others, uh, they talk about what's known as schema, which is a pattern of thought that organizes information uh, and the relationships between the, that information. So your schema formulates your core beliefs. Now this uh, image here is quite commonly used when talking about the cognitive view of depression. The middle part there is known as the, um, the triad, uh, also known as um, Beck's cognitive triad. And this triad forms a vicious circle. It's, it's one thing leads to another, which is, exacerbates another, and it just keeps going on and on and on. So you could have negative views about yourself, perhaps you think you're ugly, uh, negative views about the world, uh, everyone ignores me, and maybe negative views about the future. Um, my looks will get worse in time and people will continue to even ignore me even further. So these things just kind of feed into each other um, from self to world to future. It crosses both space and time. And these are negative automatic thoughts or gnats. And it's important to know that gnats are not always vocalized. The thoughts you have are not fully formed in sentences. So it's the job of the psychologist to actually have the person vocalize their thoughts so they can capture or say, ha, you're, there's a thought there that you might have to restructure um, every time you think this, I want you to think something alternatively. Um, let's, I'll get to that in just a moment, the cognitive restructuring. Uh, the two schemata that are most common in depressed people are the self-blame schema. Uh, that's when you internalize problems. Uh, even if it has nothing to do with you, you might think a bad situation was all down to you. And ineptness. You're going to fail before you even do something. You have an expectation of failure. Okay. So there's a lot of jargon here, uh, maybe to simplify, your core beliefs formed by your schema uh, lead to negative automatic thoughts and these lead to cognitive errors. What are some common cognitive errors that people have? Uh, there's several names for these. You could find you know, dozens of cognitive errors, but the ones that I like to talk about are magnification, where you exaggerate something uh, that went wrong you kind of make, you blow it up out of proportion. Uh, similar to that is you minimize the positive, minimization. 
that internalization could also be called personalization, where you uh, attribute negative feelings of others onto yourself. Uh, you overgeneralize uh, situations. This is sort of goes along with the attribution of uh, making global attributions. Okay, so one single event uh, applies everywhere, and you make conclusions based on this. And the last one is jumping to conclusions or arbitrary uh, inference, where you draw a conclusion based from insufficient or uh, no evidence. Uh, so an example of this one would be, uh, my friend hasn't texted me back. It's been six hours since I texted him. He hasn't gotten back to me. And he might jump to conclusions and say, oh, he hates me. Uh, or that girl doesn't like me after all. Well, maybe her phone is dead. Maybe she's in a meeting. Maybe she's sleeping. You don't know what the situation is, but you've used very limited data or, or evidence to draw the worst conclusion possible. So what is the solution to this? You have to have some sort of um, third party or a psychologist interfere with your negative thoughts and try to restructure them in a more uh, positive way by disputing them. So once the psychologist uh, identifies a cognitive error, he's going to point it out to you and maybe also have you replace it. So rather than saying, uh, she didn't like me because I'm ugly, or that's not a good example, let me use a better example. Um, I'm a failure after you fail the test, you should replace that thought with, I failed yesterday. Okay, there's a profound difference between I'm a failure and I failed yesterday. Or I'm a loser becomes that girl didn't, um, we didn't gel, okay? Uh, we're, we're, very, we're two very different people, okay? That's a, that's a very big difference. Uh, some people might think this is um, not as efficient as perhaps using drugs because cognitive restructuring takes weeks and weeks and weeks of you know changing someone's thinking pattern and that's not something that's easily done. So a lot of psychiatrists or psychologists will throw drugs at a situation. Uh, psychologists will recommend the person see a psychiatrist who prescribe drugs but it's good to know that uh, according to several studies including this one by a guy named Dobson in 1989 found that uh, participants who did the whole cognitive restructuring program were actually more successful than those who simply just took antidepressant drugs. And it's important to know that, you know, drugs eventually, you build a tolerance to them, you eventually have to take more and more of the drug, they have side effects. Um, whereas a thinking pattern could be much longer lasting because you're teaching the person how to restructure on their own, you're teaching them coping strategies, you're giving them homework, uh, you're challenging the, their whole fundamental um, belief system. So that's more profound than just you know changing somebody's neurotransmission. So never think that drugs is the answer. Uh, I would prefer that drugs become more of a second, third, or maybe even last resort in some situations, depending on the severity of the situation. So a lot of the stuff we've spoken about so far has been mostly uh, depression. Let's get into something called manic depression, which is no longer called manic depression, now it's called bipolar, but just to make things more complicated, uh, we could differentiate several bipolar disorders, and three that we'll talk about here are bipolar one, bipolar two, and cyclothymia. Uh, the textbook that we're using, the black one here, is a very good textbook, by the way, but it doesn't really go that far into what the differences are between these three conditions, so let's do that right now. Okay, the difference between bipolar disorders and a unipolar depression would be that obviously it has bi in it, so there are two states. There's a high as well as, a, a, as the low we just spoke about. So we know about the diagnostic criteria for depression, but what is actually mania? Let's do a simplified version of mania. You feel overly happy. Maybe you're easily agitated. Maybe you're talking a mile a minute. Maybe you're quite impulsive. You, you act without thinking. Uh, you don't think before you act, so you have impaired judgment. Maybe you're overconfident. Maybe you think you're Superman. Um, and maybe you're doing risky things. And that can include, you know, unprotected sex, gambling away your life savings, or going on these huge shopping sprees at 2 o'clock in the morning buying stuff off Amazon. Um, I know that we've all done that, maybe, or at least I've, I've gone on shopping sprees from eBay. But, you know, don't self-diagnose. That could be dangerous. 
sometimes you just have um, these short elevated moods. Usually from mania to demania, it's got to be at least a week long of this kind of behavior. All right. So separating these three is actually not that easy. Um, at least if you just read the DSM-5. So I'm going to try to simplify this as much as possible. And I think uh, this might be the best way to do it visually. For bipolar 1, you must have mania. It must be present, okay? And that's uh, a week long of the types of behaviors that we talked about before. What's really strange about bipolar 1 is you don't have to have any sort of major depressive episode, which is weird because it's called bipolar. So why would that be a possible uh, condition rather than a definite condition to have to be uh, diagnosed as bipolar? Well, the answer that's given is usually if it's never happened before, it is likely to happen eventually. The person's eventually likely to crash. Okay. So again, you have to have mania, but you don't have to have um, major depression. Whereas with uh, bipolar 2, uh, there has to be evidence of both manic, manic behavior and depressive behavior. But here's the part that is a little different. It's a hypomanic state, hypomania. What's the difference between hypomania and mania? Very simply put, it's a lesser severe form of mania, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. Cyclothymia is more of a um, not full-blown uh, of either. Uh, you have some aspects of mania, you have some aspects of depression, but it never quite reaches uh, those debilitating levels. It's, a, it's more of a, uh, a cycling uh, between these two back and forth. Okay. Um, I put up here some comorbidity uh, stuff just for gravy, but you don't need to know the comorbidity uh, unless you really want to. Uh, comorbidity being those conditions that could coexist uh, with another condition. So the difference between mania and hypomania, again, is about the severity. Um, so I didn't populate this Venn diagram, I apologize, but I'll just do it verbally. Uh, they're very similar, uh, similar symptoms. The two chief differences here is that mania has to last a week where hypomania uh, is uh, not beyond four days. And the other difference is mania is uh, debilitating. Uh, it can cause impairment of social function and occupational function, where with hypomania, you're more likely to have a job and still maintain your relationships. Okay? So again, it's about severity. Um, we'll look at this in just a few moments. Uh, here's a simpler diagnostic tool if you want to pause it and look at it. Uh, this is from WebMD, okay, so less uh, to read than the DSM. Maybe you want to know that um, bipolar 2 is more likely than bipolar 1. So the less severe one is more likely, four times more likely. I forget where I got that number from. Maybe it's from WebMD. All right. Um, let's talk about causes. Uh, in the new syllabus, uh, new to me at least, 9990, we have a source by a woman named Oric. I believe she's Croatian, and her companions. Um, and they did some rather um, special research. Uh, it's very hard to read the primary source material unless you really know genetics. Uh, I've looked at it several times. I'm not a geneticist by any means, but I'll try to simplify it and give you my understanding of the ORC et al. study. Well, first of all, um, it's been known for a while, or it's been guessed for a while, that bipolar is indeed genetic. And studies have suggested that bipolar uh, disorder-related genes exist on the X chromosome, which is one of those uh, gender determining uh, chromosomes. Um, before we get to ORIC at all, there's much simpler data we could use to use as evidence that there is a genetic link. Uh, similar to Gottsman and Shields with schizophrenia, there are studies with uh, concordance rates for monozygotic or identical twins versus uh, fraternal or dizygotic twins. And there's some, some numbers if you want to commit those to memory, that's fine. It's always good to have some evidence to support what you're saying. Uh, but as far as first-degree relatives are concerned in general, without it being a sibling relationship, it could be mother, father, or sibling, 9% uh, likelihood that one with bipolar uh, has a first-degree relative with it. Compare that to the general population, which is just 
one percent uh, chance. So um, if one percent of the, of the of the whole sample of humanity has a one percent chance of, of getting the disorder, and it jumps to nine percent if you have a family member with it, uh, that's pretty significant. It's not a huge number, but it is indeed significant. All right, so the Auric et al. study, which is much more in-depth uh, than the simplified genetic stuff I talked about just now, it's called Association Analysis of the 5H22C Receptor and the 5HT Transporter Genes in Bipolar Disorder. Um, it's a fun title. 5HT is the, um, the jargon that could be used for what we commonly call serotonin, which is the neurochemical usually associated with mood disorders or mood regulation. Uh, serotonin is also instrumental in regulating your satisfaction in eating, uh, which is probably why a lot of drugs that deal with serotonin increase, decrease, tend to have some sort of metabolic side effects, but let's not just talk about that yet. So 5-HT, uh, you could simply refer to it as serotonin if you like when you write about it, or if you want to sound uh, more learned uh, and fancy schmancy, you can just call it 5-HT uh, slash serotonin. And if you really want to go far, you can call it 5-hydroxytryptamine and then, uh, you know, run out of time during the exam. Okay, so what are we doing in this study? We're looking at two genes or two expressions of genes. We're seeing how the 17th chromosome and the X chromosome of the 23rd, in this case, are... Uh, expressing these two genes in different people. We're looking at the 5-HTT and the 5-HTR2C um, uh, genes. Uh, what will lead to the to formation of the transport uh, gene for serotonin and the receptor gene for serotonin. And we'll talk about neurotransmission later. Uh, maybe it's, it's a better idea to talk about it first, but uh, I'm sorry if I went in this order instead. So we're looking at what is responsible for, for, for passing the, the serotonin along in, in your neural pathways and what is responsible for receiving that chemical. And we're trying to see if there is indeed some connection. And let me skip this real quick. Uh, we look at 42 bipolar or diagnosed bipolar patients, and we look at 40 control, which have no family history of bipolar, just to uh, doubly check that they're not indeed susceptible to some sort of bipolar disorder through their genetic inheritance. Now, what's interesting about the study is that it was found there was no significant differences in the expression of either the 5-HTT or the 5-HR2C genes. So no matter what the outcome of the allele, uh, it didn't correlate in any way with being bipolar or not being bipolar. Um, but what happens when we separate the genders? Um, there is believed to be some sort of uh, sexually dimorphic properties to gene expression, meaning that genes express themselves uh, differently according to gender, especially if it has to do with things like the uh, X chromosome. So they decided to just look at women. And when they were separated from men, uh, there was a difference in how the receptor gene was expressed, uh, its uh, genotype. I'm sorry to use all this jargon, but I don't know how else to get through this quickly. Um, but the differences between the bipolar females and the non-bipolar females was not significant by a large margin. And I want to thank one of my students for pointing this out by looking at the p-values here, p equals 0 0.049, which means it's probably not due to chance, but it's not terribly um, uh, convincing it seems there is a trend in the expression of the receptor gene, but it's hard to make a uh, solid conclusion based on this. So this research, uh, and here's the student who uh, I want to thank, Robin, who very closely read the source material and helped me along with formulating uh, some of the presentation here today. Um, the expression of the gene doesn't seem to correlate very easily with the uh, condition of bipolar disorder. So why is this research included in our syllabus? Well, I guess it could be used as an evaluative piece of evidence to say that perhaps the 
theory that serotonin uh, genes link to bipolar disorder could be problematic. Um, there's not a lot of convincing evidence that the genes will lead to the disorder, and maybe it's also a bit uh, reductionist to have the theory that serotonin is the main contributor to the disorder. So we have to find other things besides this. Um, or it's just eliminating possibilities. All right. I looked at the other textbook that I haven't used this year, the uh, Oxford edition. I was a little confused by this textbook a bit. Um, there's a few things that I think are mistakes, and maybe someone who's watching this video could help me along. Uh, with all due respect to Craig Roberts, um, it says Oric et al. 1998. I googled that. I'm not sure if that's a separate piece of research. Uh, the numbers are not what was in the primary source. Uh, it says 49 healthy controls. Um, so the year is off, the number of controls is off, and in the evaluation it says that all the sample were gathered from Belgium, but from what I can gather, they were Croatian uh, uh, participants. So if someone could help me and say maybe this is a, a follow-up study, or maybe I'm just wrong, I've read the, the primary source uh, material wrong. And the Oric et al. study in the uh, great revision guide done by Hodder Education also seems to be a bit off. It really doesn't say much. Um, so this is new research to the syllabus. And if this research is confusing, uh, that's OK. The people who you know, even write the textbooks and even myself to a, a degree are confused by the research because it is written for a very specialist field. Uh, there's a lot of jargon. Usually, I want students to read primary source material, but this might be one where I would say maybe read the introduction and the conclusion only. And even that is kind of hard to get through unless you're, you're deeply familiar with genetics. So in sum, you know, you could say there are genetic theories of causation having to do with serotonin transport genes or serotonin receptor genes. Uh, and if you don't know what serotonin uh, transport and reception is, we'll get into neurotransmission in just a few moments. But if you're doing the syllabus in order, you might have already done neurochemistry with dopamine and schizophrenia. Okay. okay. Uh, this is just review. Uh, again, differentiating between the three types of bipolar covered here. Bipolar one being the red line, bipolar two being the purple line, and cyclothymia being represented by the green line. Okay, different degrees of ups and downs. So what treatments can we prescribe for affective disorders such as bipolar and unipolar depression? Um, most people in the West are very familiar with Prozac. It is still very popular. It is an SSRI. We'll talk about what that means in just a moment. Um, but, you know, antidepressant is so prevalent, uh, antidepressant drugs are so prevalent, they've become part of our uh, casual conversation. Uh, the non-commercial name for Prozac is fluoxetine. You could know the commercial name for any of the drugs, even when we talk about schizophrenia, uh, you could talk about Thorazine as opposed to Clopromazine because I think it's easier to spell and it's acceptable to use commercial names as far as I know. Uh, it is not the most prescribed SSRI anymore, and this is um, kind of old research, but it's probably still similar to 2018. Uh, the most prescribed uh, drugs in the U.S., this is some meta-analysis that was done. And if you look here, look how many SSRIs are on this list. And there are no what we call MAOIs, and we'll talk about these two types of antidepressants in just a moment. SSRI stands for ser uh, serotonin selective, I'm sorry, <laughs> Selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor. And it's good to know what that stands for because it kind of tells you some of the processes uh, that's happening when you take this drug. So if you know what SSRI stands for, you might have a better understanding of what it's actually doing. MAOI stands for monoamine oxidase inhibitor. I've never asked students to memorize that, uh, but SSRI is something you might want to memorize. Um, why are SSRIs more popular than MAOIs? You'll see again on this list, there's no MAOIs. Um, they both work, and they both work very quickly, 
But the thing is, uh, SSRIs have less side effects uh, than MAOIs. MAOIs uh, tend to have more severe, uh, sorry, I don't know why I'm jumping here, uh, more severe types of side effects. So it will be an example of that. Um, I guess just more, just more side effects, water retention, dizziness, um, dry mouth. And we'll talk about why that's happening in just a moment. So SSRIs are selective, as we said, they're selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor. And I probably should have written that down somewhere on the PowerPoint here. Um, simply put, it's blocking the reabsorption or the reuptake of the excess serotonin. So when a neuron fires out the chemical to communicate with the other neuron, there's that little space in between called the synapse. And as it's spilling out into the synapse, they're kind of doing like this musical chairs thing, first come, first serve, and they bind to the other neuron on these little uh, concave receptor sites here. Uh, at least in this picture, they're, they're, they're represented through concave like half circles. So the ones that don't get to sit in the chair, if you will, they go back into the neuron from which it came. And this process is called reuptake. And once they're taken back inside, they're sucked up back inside, uh, they will be destroyed or broken down into their component parts or recycled for, for a different purpose later on, perhaps. What SSRIs do is they block that reabsorption. So that sucking up of the excess uh, doesn't happen. So that means there's more serotonin floating or staying behind in the synapse that could be used later on. Uh, there's more available. So we're not destroying the serotonin. If you recall with the schizophrenia, uh, schizophrenia uh, slides, uh, this process is done differently where the blockage is happening on the postsynaptic neuron. Here, the blockage is happening on the presynaptic neuron. MAOIs are different in that they're trying to interrupt a different process. And they're also different in that they don't discriminate between certain types of neurotransmitters. So they could affect multiple neurotransmitters at once. They're not selective. There's something called monoamine oxidase, which we could just call MAO. And that is an enzyme that destroys a neurotransmitter that's in excess. And that's back, uh, sucked up back into the presynaptic neuron. So the uptake does happen. And then the enzyme destroys the excess. We don't want to get rid of the excess. We want that extra stuff available for use later on. So we're going to create a drug called an MAOI. And those drugs are going to attack the enzyme. Just to metaphorically make this simple, let's just say they attack the enzyme, and therefore there's going to be less breakdown of the excess neurotransmitters. Now, MAO is monoamine oxidase, which is an enzyme. MAOI is monoamine oxidase inhibitor. And monoamines are several types of neurotransmitters that include adrenaline, noradrenaline, dopamine, and serotonin. So if you take an MAOI, it could affect all of the monoamines available. And this might in some way explain why there are more side effects. Since multiple neurotransmitters are being affected by MAOIs, it could wreak more havoc on your body. So these drugs so far are typical for handling depression. Um, one thing that is not in the textbook that I've seen, uh, at least not the one we're using, is the most famous treatment for bipolar disorder, which is a lithium compound. Uh, several different types of lithium compounds have been used to treat bipolar. And only recently have there been some good theories about why this works. Um, I'm wondering how it was even stumbled upon in the first place. But anyway, um, lithium is effective with about one third of patients, uh, but the side effects are quite devastating because it is a highly uh, toxic uh, element. 
An alternative to drugs is ECT, electroconvulsive therapy. And you might be familiar with ECT from famous Hollywood movies uh, where people who are institutionalized are often seen as being shocked and it might strike people as unethical. Uh, it is not unethical, especially if the family of the patient or the patient himself agrees to the procedure. It is not a first resort, um, and some people say it's only a last resort. I think I would caveat that by saying ECT is a last resort measure or a measure that should be used if there is a severe likelihood of suicide. Um, some people claim that if suicide ideation has taken place, that means that the person has actually planned things out in a very specific manner, um, then ECT is a possibility. And like lithium uh, compounds, the reason why ECT works is still somewhat of a mystery with several theories. Um, simply put, I know you might think of it as a kickstart for the brain to uh, increase activity, but it does have some side effects uh, that are not devastating, but they're not, they're not pleasant in that they might cause uh, memory loss. It's the most typical side effect of ECT. And again, it's used for usually severe cases of depression. If you're feeling uh, a bit down, don't go and shock yourself with 70 to 130 volts. That's not recommended. Um, usually the electrode is attached to the non-dominant brain hemisphere, and it is Theorize that if you do it this way, where you do unilateral ECT, which is the image on the right, uh, you're going to alleviate some of the severity of the side effects. In order to do this, you must give the person some anesthesia and muscle relaxants. And because of that, you might uh, put a oxygen mask just in case they have trouble breathing, if they're too relaxed, if they're too anesthetized and six to nine treatments a month may be given. Now the voltage is only given for a few seconds, but you'll see the person convulsing after the voltage is over. So when you see the person shaking, it's not necessarily due to the electric shock, it's actually due to a seizure that has been uh, induced into the patient. And if you wanna look on YouTube for videos, there are videos of people being shocked. Um, one video that I like to use in class is a interesting night and day case of a woman named Mary who goes pre-ECT into an interview, can't even look the person who's asking her questions in the eye, has uh, the treatments, and then a few weeks later, the same woman is interviewed about the same uh, troubling situation that bothered her prior to the treatment, and it's almost like a miracle. It's like two different people. Um, so does ECT have any efficacy? The answer is yes, and it's not as unethical as you think it is. Someone named Gagne, Gerard Gagne in 2000, did a study in which he looked at the relapse rates of people who do ECT, and he found some convincing evidence that the relapse rates are quite in the favor of non-relapse for those who take uh, regimented ECT treatments. So 93% of patients after two years of treatment did not relapse um, after that period. Oh, I'm sorry, after two years after that period. So that's four years in total. So two years of treatment, uh, then two years later, no relapse. Whereas for people who are on antidepressants only, that number goes down drastically to 52%. So just like I talked about with cognitive behavioral therapy, CBT, and cognitive restructuring, ECT is a better choice, uh, which is surprising for most people. Uh, but again, I would say for this is only for those who are severely um, fatigued, lethargic, guilty. You know, they're, they're just they're not able to function essentially. Okay. Uh, this is a past paper from the old syllabus. There's not much uh, to look at from the new syllabus, so I just thought this was an interesting question where you have a situation where a doctor has two patients. One Kate is a new patient who has never had depressive symptoms before, but is finding coping very difficult indeed. The other patient, Sally, has been depressed for a long time, and Dr. Phillips has tried all kinds of different treatments without much success. The question asked, uh, describe one suitable treatment for Kate. And I find it interesting that the marking scheme accepts ECT 
as an answer. Uh, it would seem that ECT would be more likely for Sally, who's had all different types of treatments without much success. Uh, again, I don't think it's a first resort uh, combatant to depression, but if all else fails and if she is ideating suicide, you might want to think about ECT. Nothing in the question tells us that Kate is suicidal, severely suicidal, or um, you know, unable to function. She just says it's very hard to cope. Uh, that can mean a lot of things. Uh, so we talked about chemical and drugs. We talked about monoamine oxidase inhibitors or MAOIs. We talked about SSRIs, so all of that is there. We talked about ECT. We talked about cognitive restructuring. And in prior videos, we've talked about rational emotive therapy, um, which is very similar or to what we talked about with the ABC model of disputing people's irrational beliefs. So those are the most common treatments. Again, this is the old syllabus, so the new syllabus is probably going to concentrate more on bipolar disorders, but remember that antidepressants are also prescribed for bipolar. Um, so it's sort of, I hate to say it, like a one-size-fits-all in your answering. Okay, I think I'll stop there. I hope this video made some sense. Uh, even the genetic stuff made some sense. Uh, I probably should have slept more last night, but, um, you know, we'll see. Maybe I'm suffering from one of those nine um, diagnostic criteria and I'm not sleeping well because of insomnia. Who knows? But good luck on any assessment you have in the near future. And for my own students, I hope this helps you with your outlining. All right. Have a good day.